Today's video is sponsored by Alien Clothing. Hello, welcome back to Marky's School for Gifted Nitpickers. Boy howdy, has it been a long year. And a lot of you guys have been telling me that I haven't made that many videos this year, which isn't true, but I've been planning something. A little secret video that I've been working on for a few years. This this is it. The one you're watching. That's that's the video. That's right. The day has finally come. The video that five people have asked me to make. We're gonna watch X-Men today. So yeah, I guess this is a new cosmonaut tradition. Whenever winter rolls around, I get the urge to end the year in a bang by watching and reviewing every movie in a really long series. And now we finally get to watch a series that I am not familiar with. That's right, I've only seen a handful of the X-Men movies. I think I've seen like half of them. And the ones that I have seen, I don't really remember so good. You see, X-Men are kind of my comic book blind spot. I've read some of the core comics, but not much more beyond that. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I'm kind of a fraud. I uh, haven't read a comic book in a really long time. But it's okay, things are gonna change today. Okay, I got a whole stack of stuff. All right, while I watch these X-Men movies, I'm gonna read the comic books, all right? I've got more down there too, you can't see them, but there, there's a lot. I have the Marvel app, I didn't need to buy these. Now originally I was going to do the first three movies in one video, and then all these ones in another video, and then the Wolverine ones in another video. No, no, we're not doing all that. Fuck that. In this video, I'm going to do the first trilogy and those weird prequel movies all at once. Then the next video will be everything else. But before we start with X-Men 1, you guys already know that this video is going to get demonetized. I'm doing seven movies. One of them is going to get this video blocked. So first, we need to have a word from a brand new sponsor. This video is sponsored by Alien Clothing. That's right, today we're doing something a little different for our ad. You see, I'm very picky with the clothing that I wear. I am very particular about my drip, and that's why this is a brand that I strongly recommend. Alien is an indie streetwear brand started a few years ago by my good buddy Elvis the Alien. And let me say, this merch is on another level. Like I said, I'm picky about what I wear, but Elvis really created this brand for people like us who are into anime and video games. And look, you guys aren't fooling me. I know that's what you're into, that's why you're here. So if you want to wear stuff that suits your nerdy tastes while actually being stylish, then head over to AlienClothing.com and use code COSMO to get 20% off of anything. Yes, anything. And this stuff is hot. It goes fast and for good reason. These designs are curated from some of the best artists around the world and some of them don't get restocked, so you gotta jump on them when you see them. And trust me, this stuff looks and feels great. I am particularly a fan of the hoodies, that's why this is what we're wearing in today's YouTube video. I've had a lot of friends try to steal this hoodie from me, and they're not gonna get it. So remember, if you wanna update your drip, head over to AlienClothing.com and use code COSMO at checkout for 20% off. And of course, I'd like to thank Alien for sponsoring this video. X-Men 1 is fine. It's, it's okay. Now, all things considered, I actually have kind of a soft spot for this movie. See, when I was a kid, this shit was like my favorite movie. I thought the 90s X-Men cartoon was so cool, but I never really caught that many episodes. But somehow, I still liked the X-Men, and I think I enjoyed them purely for their aesthetic. I mean, look at this character design. Maybe it's my 90s kid millennial consumer brain rot talking, but something about these designs is just so... Mm, they look delicious, I wanna chew on them. So when my dad took me to see an X-Men movie as a kid, forget about it, I thought this shit was so cool. But boy, I gotta say, I don't know why I liked this as much as I did. It's not a bad movie, but it's definitely a product of its time. Oh, here we go, this is the best part. Check out these physics. Yep, around we go. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense, but fuck it, who cares? And you see, this movie's special because it came out right before Spider-Man ruined everything. I'm saying that if you've been watching this channel for a little while now, you'll notice that a lot of the superhero movies that came out right after Spider-Man are basically just bad Spider-Man ripoffs. So honestly, the best thing about this movie is that it has its own identity. It's interesting to watch a superhero movie that isn't trying to copy other superhero movies, because this was like the first one. 
This is a very different kind of superhero movie because it takes itself very seriously a lot of the time. To a degree that you just don't see nowadays. I don't think a lot of people realize that Joss Whedon really changed the way superhero movies work. Avengers 1 is basically the template that most of these movies follow nowadays, but back then you got movies like this. This is basically a drama about prejudice and injustice, and it just so happens to star an immortal Canadian with swords in his hands. After a few scenes that establish that this movie is about human inequality, we have Rogue, who accidentally puts her boyfriend in the pussy prison, the pussy be like, oh, 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 oh. and then runs away to a barren, violent wasteland, Canada. Then she meets Wolverine, played by Hugh Jackman, and this is where I give my most head-ass take of all time. But I never really loved Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. And no, I'm not gonna try to convince anybody that I'm right. I'm not gonna convince anyone that he doesn't fit the role because my opinion is very biased and strange. The only reason I don't like him is because I don't like how tall he is. Now hear me out. Wolverine is supposed to be a disgusting little manlet. He's supposed to look like a short, little hairy slab of meat, little angry chode man. I'm reading the comics now and everybody calls him short and stinky all the time. And you just don't get to see that kind of character in a superhero movie. Even when superhero actors are short, they have to wear platform shoes so they can seem taller and more heroic. Well, I'm sick of it, okay? I want more short superheroes. And being short is part of Wolverine's identity. But I do still think Jackman obviously does a good job as the character. I mean, even in the worst X-Men movies, it'll still have Wolverine acting his ass off. And I gotta respect that. So whatever, it may not be what I want, but I can acknowledge that it's fine. Also, this is unrelated, but I like how this movie has whimsical music whenever we see some mutant superpowers for the first time. What am I watching, E.T.? Why is this so adorable? And it's kind of funny how in all of our big ensemble superhero movies nowadays, we have to spend an hour getting the characters together. But in this movie, the X-Men just show up and save Logan and Rogue immediately. No fanfare, no buildup, we don't even know who these people are. Fuck it, we don't have time to waste. From here, the rest of the movie is kind of a fish out of water narrative featuring Wolverine, which is a little weird. This movie spends a lot of time explaining mutant injustice to Wolverine. Like, he should just know all of this. He is so old. And you see, like I said earlier, this movie is taking itself really seriously. The man who attacked you is an associate of his called Sabretooth. Sabretooth? Storm. What do they call you? Wheels? What are you on about? You call yourself Wolverine. If there's anything corny or campy from the source material, this movie is like, hey, isn't it dumb how corny comic books are? This is a movie for grown-ups. You actually go outside in these things? What would you prefer? Yellow spandex? Yeah, actually, I would prefer that. I said that before. But the thing is, I'm sorry, this movie is still corny and I'm fine with corny. I like corny, but it's awkward because this film thinks it's more serious and more self-aware than it actually is. How are you gonna make a movie about a guy with hair like this, who again has swords in his hands and a metal skeleton and try to play it completely straight? I really just don't understand. But also this movie isn't interested in wasting any time over explaining anything and it's kind of funny. Xavier is like, hello Logan, this is my school for displaced Homeless super children. Also, I have a superhero strike force and a mega plane in the basement. Why? Don't worry about why. Like there's another weird part later in the movie where the evil mutants attack Storm and Cyclops at the train station and Storm like obliterates Sabretooth, but then Sabretooth just walks away and kidnaps Rogue. And then they all come back through the station and Storm and Cyclops aren't there anymore. And they're not outside either. They're just gone. Like, where did they go? They were here to save their friends, but they just left. This movie is really just rushing to get to the next set piece or cool scene. Back then, you could just have plot holes because we didn't have YouTubers to overthink everything and convince people that movies with plot holes are bad. What? Anyway, let's look at a funny out of context scene. <laughs> Ugh. 
I should also say that in this movie, the best performance has definitely come out of Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart. I particularly like seeing McKellen playing a villain for once. I think it's fun and kind of sexy. I think I've had one too many Lord of the Rings rewatches because seeing him as a mustache twirling bad guy is just very exciting for me. But I will say that I think the lamest part of this movie is that the other characters just straight up suck. Cyclops is a very boring person. I'm only just now learning this. Uh, I'm a little disappointed because I still think he looks very cool. Anna Paquin is doing her best as Rogue, but she's pretty stiff and awkward, and she was like a kid, so it's fine, I guess, but it's a little more noticeable. She does get better as the movies go on, but she's also not really in them as much later either. Unfortunately, Rogue's superpower kind of breaks the story a lot of the time, so she doesn't really have anything to do after this movie. Yeah, that's a problem that we're gonna be encountering a lot later. Storm is also in this movie. She stands around and poses. He's just standing there, menacingly! She seriously doesn't do anything in this movie. She's just here because, well, it's an X-Men movie. She barely has any lines either. One of her only lines is like one of the worst lines I've ever heard. Do you know what happens to a toad when it's struck by lightning? The same thing that happens to everything else. That doesn't even make any sense. Anyway, let's talk about the plot real quick. In this movie, the X-Men have to stop Magneto's evil super plan. He uses this big machine to turn normal people into mutants, which is just so silly. Oh shit, hold on. That's actually canon. So he runs his beta test on this senator that hates mutants. But what's silly is that after he mutifies the senator, he just leaves him alone in a jail cell. This is not a good plan. If he got powers, that were anything like any of the other mutants that we have seen so far, he could easily break out and leave. I like the initiative, but the execution needs some more work, so I'm gonna give this plan a six out of 10. At the end of the day, this is a superhero flick where the bad guy makes a big machine that will kill all the innocent people, and the good guys fly in and save the day. And if it wasn't for the genuinely good allegory for prejudice, this would be a pretty by the numbers movie. And as usual, I think a lot of the ensemble superhero movies like this would do better with less characters. And a little bit more focus on character development. It leaves this movie feeling a little empty. And I gotta say, that is something that is not fixed with most of these movies. It's weird though, because this really was like the first modern superhero movie. Is it fair to say this is cliche when this was the first one to have this structure? This led to Spider-Man, which led to Iron Man, which led to Avengers, and now look at us. Society is full of fucking nerds. Thanks a lot, X-Men. So I'm gonna wrap this up and give this a uh, 5.5 out of 10. Sure, whatever. This took way too long. X2. I love when movies used to do this. Like, oh, we can't call it Terminator 2, we gotta call it T2. They'll know what it means. There's no other movie that starts with T. Oh, and by the way, this movie actually kinda goes hard. Yeah, everybody knows that this movie is a vast improvement over the first one. Where the first movie gives you no context for a lot of the things that we see, this one dives a little deeper into almost every aspect. Logan's origins are explored more, and we get to learn a little bit more about some of the characters that this series wants to focus on, like, Jean Grey and Bobby. And to start, I gotta say, I really like when a movie opens in a cool way. I think the last movie had a pretty decent opening with that really powerful Holocaust scene, but this one decides to go in a different direction and give us this action-packed opening. While the last movie wasn't really great on the action, this one starts off with a sick-ass scene that establishes Nightcrawler as a badass. This scene is very sick, and it's a damn shame that for some reason, Nightcrawler disappears after this movie. As for the story, this movie features Logan Roy as the villain. And as a kid, I remember, I didn't think this guy was that cool and he wasn't as interesting as Magneto. But now as a grown up, I think he actually suits this movie pretty well. See, Magneto is your standard comic book villain, but Stryker is somehow more menacing by just being like a normal guy. At the end of the day, the main threat to X-Men is humankind. So it's always effective to use a villain that represents that. Like with other films in this series, I haven't seen this movie since it came out, so I like totally forgot the story. And as it stands, I think the narrative of this is much better paced than the last movie. The last one kind of just had the main characters waiting around until the story came to them. But in this, the plot kicks off immediately with the assassination attempt on the president, followed by Charlie getting kidnapped, 
And I've noticed in my recent read-through of X-Men, Charles Xavier gets kicked out of this story fairly frequently because I guess he's a little too OP and he would solve a lot of the conflicts too easily. And like I've said before, that is a problem that kind of permeates throughout all of these movies. See, the X-Men all have very diverse superpowers, and that can be kind of hard to include in a story. Oh, you got a guy who can teleport anywhere. Well, that might make a story a little more complicated if you're not writing around him. Alternatively, you have someone like Wolverine, who's just a guy who can fight people, and he's not very complicated, so he can be in any story. Rogue, however, has the superpower to take away other people's superpowers so she could honestly solve conflicts a little too easily. As such, after the first movie, she doesn't really get to use her powers. And I really see that as the writers of these movies kind of failing. Mutants kind of come and go in these movies, so you can't really get too attached to them. So yes, this is the first of many films where Charles Xavier is kicked out of the narrative because he is just too strong. But it works a little better in this movie because it means that our characters can actually work on their own, as opposed to in the last movie where they had to rely on him a bit more. The one issue with the movie's faster pace is that we still don't get the best characterization for everybody. Nightcrawler gets a lot of good characterization, but in his nice conversation with Storm, I can't help but think about how she still hasn't done anything. She's just a nothing character. She's just here. This series so far hasn't been the best at balancing each character, but I will say that this one is a big improvement over the last one. Logan gets a lot more to do in this movie, and we get to see him trying to balance his own goals with his need to help his new friends. This one includes him in the story a lot better, and there's a lot of times where Logan can kind of just feel like the guy who's here to fight stuff and look cool. So I appreciate when the movie actively includes him in the narrative. But one thing that definitely doesn't come across so great in this movie is the Logan and Jean romance. It feels very rushed and out of nowhere. We're never really told or shown why Logan likes Jean. He just thinks she's hot. And I mean, I guess I could respect that, but this is a movie, so I need a little bit more than that. And she's in a committed relationship with Scott, who is not really in this movie. So it comes across as a little bit more predatory in this one. Let's just say that you probably wouldn't see scenes like this in a superhero movie nowadays. But despite a few shortcomings, I still think this movie does its best with what it has. I especially like that Magneto teams up with the X-Men, and he's gone from cartoonishly over-the-top villain to the X-Men's sassy gay uncle. We love what you've done with your hair. It's what she deserves. And honestly, uh, other than that, I don't really have much more to say about it. It's got better action, has a more creative plot, and it's just a little more engaging and exciting. It's been a very long time since I've last seen this movie, and I had a pretty good time with it. And it leaves off in a way that lends pretty well to a sequel. So I'm gonna give this one a 7 out of 10. This movie is terrible. Please let me go. Keep it up. I'll spray you in the face, bitch. This is the movie that kind of sent X-Men into a downward spiral for a little while. After two well-received and successful movies, we get one of the messiest superhero movies that have ever been made up to that point. Hey! I can fly! Now, strangely enough, this movie begins with something I did not expect to see in 2006. Young face CGI. As expected, it looks kinda weird, but honestly, for 2006, I'm surprised they even fucking tried. But unfortunately, we as a society know what Patrick Stewart is supposed to look like when he's younger. Because he's looked the same for like 50 years. So this just looks fucked up. But in this flashback, Chuck and Magnus are going to visit Jean Grey. This one focuses a lot on Jean and her Phoenix bullshit. But if you guys have been paying close attention, we have not gotten the strongest characterization from anybody, let alone Jean Grey. We haven't really gotten strong characterization for anybody who isn't Logan, Magnus, or Charles. And I can now say, after having read at least some X-Men comics, that I'm not really into Jean Grey. There are way more female mutants that are much more interesting than Jean Grey. And right after Jean dies, she's replaced with Kitty Pride, who is a much more compelling character. Hell, Rogue is even more interesting. But no, Jean has this big, important X-Men story about her, so obviously we gotta adapt it for the big screen. Twice. And guess what? It doesn't work, but I'm gonna get into that much later. 
But anyway, after that, we get our second opening scene, featuring some pretty gruesome body horror of Archangel cutting off his own fucking wings with a knife. I gotta say, this trilogy has been much darker than I've expected, and it's kind of jarring. I mean, I haven't really even seen much more than a drop of blood in a modern Marvel movie, and in this movie, I'm watching a child mutilate himself. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I'm just saying I didn't expect it. But after that, we get a third opening scene. Remember earlier when I said that a good opening can hook the viewer? This is basically the exact opposite. Three scenes that make us feel nothing is significantly worse than one strong scene. In this scene, we see a vision of the future where the X-Men are at war, and it's surprisingly kind of goofy. Like Wolverine is joking around, and I don't really know if this is supposed to be dire or not. Oh wait, it wasn't a cold open? It was modern day? But, but you told me it was in the future. The movie just lied to me. I don't know if you're allowed to do that. So the conflict in this movie is that the government wants to send out a cure for the mutants. Some of the mutants are like, yeah, I want to be a real boy. And some are like, fuck you, I still want to shoot lightning. Magneto himself is obviously in the latter camp. But my issue that has slowly arisen with each of these movies is that Magneto isn't really the most threatening villain. After watching him bumble his way through his plan in the first movie, and then spending the whole second movie being sassy and petty, I cannot find this man threatening now that he's back to being a villain. I'm sorry, I still see him as a sassy gay old man. I love this scene where Mystique loses her powers and he's just like, uh, sorry, you're in your flop era, honey. I'm sorry, my dear. You're not one of us anymore. I haven't heard any of my gay friends I've use this I've never heard phrase. this from any gay person. No. Anyway, just a few scenes later, Gene comes back to life and kills Cyclops. Yeah. This movie's really fucked up. He dies off screen, too. And I remember when I saw this as a kid, I swore it had to be a joke. The movie already lied to us once before, so how are we supposed to believe this? But no, it's true. He just dies. Which is insane. It completely removes the chance of Scott being an interesting character. Like I said before, he doesn't do anything in the first movie, and then he gets kicked out of the second movie to make room for the people we actually like, and now he just dies. And we don't even know how or why. We don't even see it happen. The only explanation of Jean's survival is that her powers wrapped her in a cocoon of telekinetic energy. That is the dumbest thing that I've ever heard. Okay, uh, believe it or not, that's also canon, actually. So now at the third movie, we have an info dump from Chuck on the powers of the Phoenix. And let me just say, this is a lot to lay on us at once. In the comic books, the Phoenix storyline is one that was built up over a long period of time. But here we have exactly one movie in the trilogy that is devoted to it. And honestly, it's the B plot. It's not even the most important part of the movie. I have no idea why this movie is trying to tell two completely disconnected stories. But anyway, in the next scene, Jean Grey kills Professor Xavier. <laughs> yeah, this movie's pretty fucked up. If we hardly had any compelling characters before, now we really don't have shit. All we have is Logan and Storm. The movie's barely halfway over by this point, and we didn't even have time to mourn Cyclops. By this point, I was still convinced he was alive. This is not the way you kill a character, and they've done it twice. There's also this little moment that I find hilarious where Pyro is like, you should have been the one to let me kill Charles Xavier, and Magneto says this. Charles Xavier did more for mutants than you'll ever know. And this is just so baffling. Multiple times in this trilogy, he has proven that he will sacrifice anyone. It was just one movie ago where he left Charles Xavier to die. But now he cares? He is so inconsistent. The only character that we as an audience have to latch onto in this movie at this point is Logan. And he has no horse in this race. He has no stakes in this plot. Other than the fact that he likes Jean Grey for some reason that we are never privy to. Everything here is just so messy. There's no subtlety at all anymore. In the last movie, our heroes convinced the fucking president of the United States that mutants aren't a threat. But uh oh, that means that we don't have a story anymore. So now the government is like, fuck it, we gotta get rid of the mutants and kill Magneto. 
Like, all right, fuck me. I guess the last movie doesn't matter. So since there are no X-Men left, Magneto and his goons have to get rid of the mutant cure. And his goons are like, Magneto, we have to get over to that island. That's where the cure is held. And his solution is to fly the Golden Gate Bridge over to the island. Charles always wanted to build bridges. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Remember when I said that subtlety is completely gone? Yeah, I wasn't joking. Now Magneto is throwing flaming cars at the X-Men. Like, why, why do they have to be on fire? What's the difference between getting hit by a flying car and a flying car that's on fire? And man, look at this pathetic hero lineup. We have a guy who has to carry so much of this movie that he doesn't even have time to act like Wolverine. A woman who never got any characterization in any of these movies. Another guy who just got introduced in this movie. And Colossus, who is also here. Yeah, he's been here the whole time. He's barely had any lines. I can count his lines on one hand, and I don't need that many fingers to do so. It is just impossible to get invested in this final battle. And again, why the fuck is Jean Grey here? They haven't justified her inclusion in this story at all. After she killed Charles, there really hasn't been anything for her to do. These two plot lines didn't need to be slammed together like this. But anyway, in the end, they decide to nerf Magneto and turn him into a normal human and get rid of his powers, which honestly is a pretty good fate for him in this trilogy. It kind of harkens back to his plan in the first movie. But then the screenwriters are like, wait, even though the main story is over and the bad guy has been defeated, we forgot to use Jean. So yeah, then she decides to fly around and Thanos everybody. What have I done? This man's motivations are being written by a child. Save me. What? Now you love her? You don't even know her! This really is one of those movies that gets worse the longer it goes on. This movie's so bad, it kind of makes the second one not seem so good. Luckily though, the best thing about this movie is that it's short. And honestly, this first trilogy is a perfect example of how the X-Men movies go. Some are painfully average, some are pretty good but not amazing, and some are butt-ass garbage. This movie is goofy and not intentionally so. And overall, I don't really think it worked very well. And this one is so bad that I'm gonna throw it on the worst superhero movie tier list. So yeah, three out of 10. Time for the next one. So yeah, that last trilogy was kind of hit or miss, and it led to a dark age of X-Men movies. Because after X-Men 3 was X-Men Origins Wolverine, a movie that is so bad that I almost made a Worst Superhero Movies video on it last year. But then I decided I was going to do everything X-Men related in one video, so I kind of just put it on the shelf. And normally I would do that one next, because it is the next movie but I want to do the Wolverine trilogy all together in the next video. For this one, we are just going to cover the actual X-Men movies, you know, the ones with the X-Men. So naturally, that brings us to X-Men First Class, the last X-Men movie that I personally have watched. And I gotta say, this movie's pretty fucking good. After watching all of these, I think I can safely say that this is my favorite X-Men movie. And finally, after all this time, we finally get the one thing I've asked for. Good characters. This movie is basically an origin story for Charles and Eric, and it not only flushes out their relationship, but their personalities as well. Charles is normally a pretty stoic and frankly boring character in these movies. But since he's younger here, we can see him at a very formative time in his life. I like that one of his first scenes shows him using his powers to hit on women at a bar. It immediately catches your attention because it's a cute subversion of our expectations. And for once, we get to see Charles using his real gift, his ability to relate to his fellow mutants. This movie has some cute montages, and the best one is where he trains his first batch of X-Men. We went from a movie trilogy with very weak characters to a movie that actually manages to balance out each one of the X-Men pretty well. And this one really puts the X in X-Men by making Charles the main character. It's such a simple and effective idea, and I'm surprised more stories don't take this approach. Oh, and also, uh, Mystique is his adopted sister. Uh, yeah. Remember when they mentioned that? 
yeah, that ever-present issue of the continuity of these movies is still present here. In the last three movies, Mystique was just a lady who did karate, but now she's a whole-ass character. She didn't get a lot of time to do much more than looking sexy in the other movies, but now her conflict with her role in society is explored a bit more. I particularly like the subplot with her and Hank debating on whether they should hide their physical mutations. And in this one, we get to see what she sees in Magneto and why she would side with him. But speaking of improved characters, by far the most improved character here is Magneto. In the other movies, he's a megalomaniacal freak who doesn't seem to even like mutants. He treats everybody with this level of disrespect to the point where I don't really see him as a mutant freedom fighter. He doesn't like anybody. It's very hard to understand why anybody would side with him here. He's very clearly wrong and crazy. But in this movie, he actually seems like a well-rounded character. His motivations are actually clear, and for once, you kind of agree with him. And that's when Magneto is at his best, when you can see his perspective. Make the villain a character that you kinda sorta don't think is wrong. It's very simple and I'm glad that these movies finally get it right. I also love how the duality of these two characters is explored in creative ways. In one scene we see Eric ordering a beer and then killing Nazis that ruined his life. Right after it cuts to Charles downing a beer at a party full of people that like him. It's a good juxtaposition that shows how their environment has changed their lives, how their lives are similar, and if circumstances were just a little different, they may have ended up following different paths. I'd also be a fool to forget to mention that the two characters are being portrayed by two crazy good actors. Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen had very good chemistry with each other, and now they are being replaced by Michael Fassbender and James McAvoy. The thing is, they don't really need to remind us exactly of Charles and Eric from the other movies. They're doing their own thing, which works better in my opinion. Because I see this as less of a prequel and more of a reimagining. Because if you see this as a true prequel, your brain might melt when you try to connect it to the previous movies. I remember I saw it as kind of a soft reboot and it works best when you watch it with that mindset. And this movie is a vast improvement over the previous trilogy in about every way. For one, it's much better at balancing tone. The other movies kind of felt like they were embarrassed to be superhero movies, but this movie in particular is great at balancing a mature story with comic book silliness. That's not to say the movie's perfect, there are still a few corny lines. You should be Professor X, and you should be Magneto. The Wolverine cameo is cute, but it goes on just a little too long. I really don't understand why these movies are so obsessed with Wolverine. He shows up even when the story doesn't need him. January Jones cannot act to save her life in this movie, and this movie also kills the only X-Man whose power is to not die. Each of us will face a choice. The enslaved. Oh my god, that's racist. And of course, the last scene in this movie is so unintentionally hilarious. Now the main problem area is up here. This area is not good either. I hate this, but I'm mainly worried about this. But despite that, I think this movie kind of rocks anyway. It's well directed and it has a lot of style. And finally, finally, we get an X-Men movie with yellow jumpsuits. Eh, would you prefer yellow spandex? Yes, I would. It looks much cooler. I also gotta say that by far this movie has the best climax of them all. Every character is utilized so well. And it's crazy how much more invested I am in this relatively simple final conflict than I was in the big, dumb, explosive final battle of the last movie. Magneto lifting a bridge is pretty lame because I'm not invested in his story. Magneto lifting a submarine in this movie is moving because this whole film built up to it naturally, even if by comparison it is a smaller thing he's doing. This film basically just exists to prove that you can make a good X-Men movie. So yeah, that's not even a question. This one's my favorite that I've watched so far, and I haven't really seen any of the other films in this quadrology, so I'm actually pretty interested to see where we go from here. So yeah, I'm gonna give this uh, an 8 out of 10. I'm as surprised as anybody else. I like this one a lot. So these last three movies are ones that I have never seen before. And this one in particular is the one that I know the least about. I haven't seen the trailer and I don't even know who's in it. 
I read the comic it's based on, but other than that, I went in completely blind. And oh boy, this movie starts off with a bang. We are thrown into the distant future where the X-Men are hunted and killed by the Sentinels. And I think this movie's version of the Sentinels works pretty well. They have the ability to change to adapt to whatever mutant they're fighting, and it makes them genuinely threatening and kind of scary. Normally I hate when movies use the Mass Effect nano machine future tech design, and I've ragged on it in movies before, but I like that the design of the Sentinels actually has a purpose. Their animation is meant to mirror Mystique's transformation effect. I think it's pretty clever as far as the design goes, and it works towards making them more threatening. As for the story, this is the epic grand finale that X-Men 3 wanted to be. This film has a sense of finality to it, as it brings back every character we've seen so far, and it crafts this time travel narrative that can fit in all these characters from different eras. And it's actually pretty nice to come back and see these characters, even though I've criticized them in the past. In this movie, they have to go back in time and stop this scientist named Trask from being assassinated and kicking off this anti-mutant war. So in order to stop the assassination, they send Logan back in time. And in the original Days of Future Past story, they send Kitty back. And it's a great story for fleshing out her character since she was pretty new to the team back then. And this is the story arc where I was really sold on her and she's since become one of my favorite X-Mans. But in this movie, I gotta say, I do like that they send Logan back. Yes, this film series has kind of a huge hard-on for Wolverine. And while I think that's a detriment in movies that we're gonna talk about in the next video, I think it's actually acceptable here, because he really has been the main character of most of these stories, so it's nice to give him one final team up to end things off. And this film is good for people who have been trying to pay attention to the previous ones, but like all X-Men movies, it is very selective with the continuity it wants to preserve. Like we saw Toad in the first movie, but now he's here in the 70s, and he somehow looks older. And oops, we took away Professor Xavier's legs in the last movie but we kind of need him to walk again for plot convenience. So now he takes a magic serum that can temporarily restore his spine. Gee, that kind of medical advancement would be fucking world changing. It's a shame that stops existing after this movie. The funniest one though, is that in this movie, Trask is played by Peter Dinklage. In X-Men 3, he's played by this man. Am I alone in this? I didn't know y'all noticed he was white. So anyway, this story starts off with a pretty straightforward time heist where our heroes go back in time to stop Mystique from assassinating the guy who invented the Sentinels. And I gotta say, the movie gets really interesting once everything goes to shit. The story kind of throws us for a loop in the middle where the assassination does get thwarted, but new problems arise because of it. All hell kind of breaks loose, and I love not knowing where this story is going to go next. This is a very different kind of story. None of the mutants are getting along, normal humans aren't even sure if mutants are real yet, so their prejudices are still forming, and we are directly shown the consequences of our hero's failure, so we know the constant threat. This one also ups the ante as far as the spectacle goes. When the writers actually know what to do with a mutant, they use their powers in pretty creative ways. In every single one of these, I'll say that Magneto is probably the most consistent as far as showing his powers in ways that you wouldn't even think are possible. But in this movie, this is especially apparent with Quicksilver. Quicksilver in this series makes the Quicksilver in the MCU look like an absolute joke. Here he has personality and we get to see his powers used in one of the best scenes in the franchise. Before I watched this movie, people would always tell me, bro, wait until you see the Quicksilver scene. And I admit, I was not disappointed. I didn't really fully get why people were so excited that this guy shows up in WandaVision, but now that I've experienced him here, I'm pretty upset that he was wasted as this cheap tease in that show. And this scene is honestly a little too good because you never see something this cool ever again. But overall, I do think this movie is actually pretty dope. And it sucks that this and X2 are directed by a massive piece of shit. It's very hard to watch anything nowadays without encountering at least one bad person. There are a lot of different hands that go into the making of a movie. It's not just up to one bastard. But it's safe to say that the directing in these movies has never really been the strong suit. And to be honest, the best thing in these new movies has been the performances. Seeing Hugh Jackman acting alongside McAvoy is pretty cool. It's fun to see a seasoned and wiser Logan teaching a young, misguided Charles. It's a nice little twist on what we saw in the first movie. And I like seeing McAvoy and Patrick Stewart act in the best scene in the whole movie. This is the kind of stuff that makes time travel fun in comic book stories. And if I had to come up with some criticisms, I'd say that this movie spends a little too much time pontificating on hope and the future of mutant kind. Yeah, this is all very nice, but we've been talking about this stuff 
in every X-Men movie. So I kind of want to see something new. And I got to say that even though the middle act of this movie kind of excited me, it doesn't really pay off as much as I'd like. I think this story definitely peaks in the first half. It loses a lot of steam after the halfway point, but it's still far from a bad story. I still think First Class is a much better movie from beginning to end, but I was not at all disappointed by the end of this one. I particularly like that this one feels like the grand finale of the X-Men movie series. This one is definitely the most ambitious X-Men movie I've seen so far, and I liked watching it. So I'm gonna give this one a seven out of 10. Yeah, that seems fair. Is it just me or do these intros kind of feel like the Doctor Who intro? That's like the same shit. So anyway, the last two X-Men movies were pretty good. And I gotta admit, the last one worked really well as like the final X-Men movie. The resolution to that movie was so good as a send-off to all the other movies before it. I mean, it even retcons X-Men 3. That's how thorough it is. After a finale that's that conclusive, you need a pretty good reason to continue the series. So does Age of Apocalypse justify its existence? No. Not at all. This movie is shockingly terrible. This film is kind of the epitome of beating a dead horse. For some reason, this looks and feels like the cheapest X-Men movie. It looks like a CW show now. What am I looking at? If I just uploaded the final battle of this movie with no context, and then I just told you guys my score for this movie, none of you would even question me. Like, come on, look at this. They didn't even key out the green screen all the way. You can still see it. It looks like I keyed this out myself. See, when you have like curly hair, it's impossible to get it out. What can I do? Every scene where Apocalypse is talking has these rapid disorienting cuts. Like they're trying to draw focus away from him, maybe because they know he looks stupid. I don't know, I really don't understand it. We're also back to the flaws that all the other movies had. Yet again, we are back to having a film with Storm, Cyclops, and Jean Grey where they don't have any traits or personalities. Now, despite all this, if this movie actually focused on Cyclops and Jean and all of these original X-Men, we would have had a much more interesting movie. But the problem is it's trying to be another big epic X-Men movie like the last one was. But if you ask me, this should have been a smaller scale story. For a second, I was excited to see a cute scene of our reimagined X-Men going to the mall and hanging out. But when they go to the mall, they have fun off screen. We don't even see what they did. This is a gigantic missed opportunity. The second half of the movie is all about them. But again, we forgot to give them character traits. How do you mess this up? Now, the last movie basically ended in a way that means these prequel movies are actually a full-on reboot now. This is a new alternate timeline, and as such, some of the plot inconsistencies can be glossed over. But some of this shit is just so distracting. The one plot inconsistency that gets to me for some reason is that we are not meant to question the fact that none of these people have aged. Because First Class was set in 1962. This movie is set in the 80s, 20 years later. Like, damn, that X gene is really working overtime. Like, this guy right here is supposed to be in his 40s. The actor wasn't even in his 30s when this movie was made. All of these main characters are supposed to be at least over 40. Some of them are pushing 50. And none of the actors were even past their 30s here. I'm sorry, white people do not age like this. It's her. She looks amazing. She's barely aged today. Huh, yeah, that's convenient. In fact, none of you have. But fine, whatever. I won't focus on it too much. Let's talk about the actual movie. The purpose of this film is to show us how Professor Xavier went bald. I mean, I'm not really wrong about that. I mean, I just assumed that he shaves his head. 
but this film establishes that he goes bald because he absorbs too much power. I've tried to deliver that line without laughing multiple times, and that's the closest that I got. This movie tries to juggle a few too many plates at once. We have a new villain who comes out of absolutely nowhere. And the most new mutants added in a single movie. This film introduces Archangel, Psylocke, and new versions of Storm, Nightcrawler, Jean, and Cyclops. Are any of these characters developed in this movie? No way. Not this time. No. No way. Not a chance. We also have our old character Magneto going through the same tired conflict that we've seen him go through in all of these prequel movies. Now, like I said, I really liked him in First Class. I thought it was good for these movies to give him more depth. But at this point, I am officially sick of seeing him struggling with the light side and the dark side. It was well done in First Class and it was acceptable in Days of Future Past, but by this point, this is just absurd. And one very strange thing that these movies like to do is establish a completely new antagonist, but also make Magneto the other villain, even if it makes no sense. In X-Men 2, the main villain of that movie was Stryker, and also Magneto. In X-Men 3, the villain was Jean Grey, and also Magneto. In Days of Future Past, the antagonists were basically the Sentinels, but also Magneto. Hey, I can fly! And in this movie, the main villain is Apocalypse, and also Magneto. In the beginning of this movie, Magneto seems like a pretty chill guy, but all you gotta do with Magneto is go up to him and be like, hey, do you wanna go kill some people? And he's like, die, die, die! Oh, is Magneto happy and at peace now? Well, we better give him a new family and then kill him just so that he can verbally tell the audience that he's having an internal moral conflict. Is this what you want from me? Is this what I am? No, this isn't happening. There's no reason for me to go on. What? What am I fighting for? Oh, and I should also mention that this movie is now trying to retcon Quicksilver into being Magneto's son, which just doesn't make any sense in this movie. This is very clearly something they didn't plan ahead of time that they're just throwing into this at the last minute. Like, when did Magneto meet this random woman? How many families does this man have? Though I will say that Quicksilver, again, does get the best scene in this movie. On one hand, I'm glad there's a scene in this one with some life and energy, but it's also kind of annoying that we're relying on the one thing that they knew worked in the last movie. I just think that no matter what happens here, I hate everything about this movie. Like, even the costumes. They're just so uninspired. This is like an analogy for the whole movie. We had something that worked, but now we're back to this bullshit. Though I will say that this movie is definitely not boring. It is very funny. Welcome to my world. You're in my house now. This movie is just straight up desperate. Desperate to try and utilize elements that made the other movies work. If you didn't believe me when I said that this movie is manipulative, they bring back Wolverine for just one short scene where they need him to kill some people. This is so unbelievably lazy. I'm not sure if this is the worst X-Men movie that I've seen so far. Like I think Last Stand is probably the worst movie on paper, but this one is just so much more offensive. Well, at least we can all agree the third one's always the worst. Yeah, you said it, sister. So I'm putting this on our worst superhero movie tier list, and I'm giving it a 3.5 out of 10. Five, four, three, two, one. This is, this is, this is, what? This is boring. Now everybody told me that this movie was gonna be bad. I've heard this since this movie came out. So I gotta say, I've really been looking forward to it. And yeah, I mean, you guys weren't lying. It sure does suck. So this is our second attempt at making a Phoenix story for the big screen. And you know how great it went the last time. <laughs> But this time around, the movie's trying to be more comic book accurate, which means we get a lot of extra bullshit that we didn't really need. Also, I need to bring up the fact that this movie is set in the 90s, which means that Charles Xavier is supposed to look like this by now. Yep, you are looking great, Charlie. 
Anyway, probably the most noticeable thing about this movie is that the script is, how should I put this? Uh, let's just say that it's doo-doo. And by the way, the women are always saving the men around here. You might want to think about changing the name to ex-women. But despite that, the performances here are actually not that bad. I gotta say that at the very least, the actors in these movies really are trying. Nicholas Holt has kind of been an unsung hero in these movies. His performance has been very good, and this scene in the kitchen is like the best he does. But that does not mean that his character is written very well, but we'll get to that in a minute. At the same time, we have Jennifer Lawrence, who really has been giving it her all, but at this point, it's very obvious that she clearly does not want to be in these movies anymore. Can we just let Mystique leave? She's been here long enough. Oh, uh, that's one way to do it. So yeah, in this movie, Jean Grey kills Mystique. This movie's so fucked up. This is kind of the big event that causes both Beast and Magneto to lose their goddamn minds. They go on this evil revenge murder quest to kill Jean Grey, and now Beast has no reason to instantly become this bloodthirsty. Yes, he loved Raven, but it doesn't suit his character. He isn't this irrational, and he's the last person who should be resorting to violence. And then we have Magneto, and oh man, do not get me started on Magneto. At this point, he is just laughably stupid. Every single one of these fucking prequel movies has the same arc for Magneto. This dude flops back and forth between good guy and bad guy in the most unnatural way. In one scene, he's like, I need to be a good man and not act out and not go crazy because I want to give mutants a good name. I have people to protect. And then Beast is like, hey, you want to go kill Gene? And he's like, death to all of them. It's kind of weird at this point how every character loves Mystique so much. Especially when you look back on the original movies and you remember the fact that she barely had any lines. But now it's like she's the only girl on the Discord server and everybody's obsessed with her. Yes, women belong in the kitchen. Except me, because I'm one of the boys. This movie has officially lost everything that made these movies enjoyable. This may be the worst one. And unlike the last movie, this one doesn't even have Quicksilver to distract us. He's in the movie for a second. But Jean Grey throws him into a bush. Yeah, that's it. He's out of the movie. He's in a coma now because he got thrown into a fucking berry bush. Remember when I said earlier that when the writers don't know what to do with a character because their power is too strong, they just get rid of him? This is probably the worst example of that. I mean, after all, we have to have more time to devote to Jean Grey. I mean, the movie is about her after all. Except for the second time, we have forgotten to give Jean Grey character traits. In this movie, the Phoenix Force enters Jean Grey's body and it causes her to go crazy and have uncontrollable powers. But she very clearly has had uncontrollable Phoenix powers in the last movie. So you're telling me that this wasn't the Phoenix Force. That's weird. But now this movie establishes that no, she did not have the Phoenix Force until just now. You could have just said that the Phoenix Force was always inside of her. Why didn't you guys plan this story ahead of time? But no, we need to reintroduce the Phoenix Force in this one because this movie has to also establish aliens. Yeah, aliens. This is basically the craziest thing that this movie can choose to do at this point. Now, yeah, aliens do show up a lot in X-Men stories, but I can say, now that I'm more familiar with the comics, that I don't really like when they do alien stuff. That's not to say that cool X-Men related sci-fi stories can't be written, but for them to introduce aliens for the first time in the final X-Men movie ever, let's just say it's kind of bold. It's also very bold to not give your main villain any motivation. Jessica Chastain's character is probably the worst superhero movie villain that I've ever seen. And I just said that same statement a few videos ago. So believe me, this was very surprising for me too. I almost can't call her a real character. Her backstory is that her planet was destroyed by the Phoenix Force. So now she wants to harness its power and destroy Earth? 
That's the thing. She doesn't really say what she wants to do. I thought that maybe she wants to help her people, but no, that's not it either. Can we just make up a reason? Can we give her any reason to be in this movie? I'll take anything. This part right here makes me laugh. Watch this. She just stands there and then. And remember, this is also the second time we're trying to adapt the Phoenix story at the last minute. And just like X-Men 3, Jean still isn't a character. Her only personality trait is that she likes her boyfriend. The only dialogue she has in this movie is her saying, I can't control my powers. People are gonna get hurt. I, I break things. I can't control it when it comes. I can't stop it. Okay, I could hurt you again. When it comes, people get hurt. When I lose control, things happen. This is how every conversation in this movie goes. It doesn't feel like a lot happens in this movie because Jean just flies around and tries to get people to help her and then they all get arrested and they fight aliens and that's it, the movie's over. By the time the final battle began, I was very surprised because it didn't feel like a final battle. I guess I could say that the final battle is at least semi-entertaining from like a dumb animal brain perspective. It's just the X-Men absolutely murdering the shit out of a bunch of people. Like, look at this fucking beatdown. But no, it's okay, don't worry, they're just aliens. This train scene is probably the only fun scene in the movie just because it's one big dumb action scene. And of course it has to devolve into boring CG pink fire bullshit. And then as expected, Jean Grey dies to save her friends. Scott, do you have any feelings about this? No? All right, and that's it. There isn't anything else I can talk about here. There's really nothing else that happens in this movie. But to be honest, somehow, this one isn't as bad as I expected. Don't get me wrong, it is not good at all. But after the last movie, I really thought I was gonna see something truly offensive to my senses. And yes, this is worse than the last one, but it's like only marginally. They still have a lot of the same problems. So let's throw it on the tier list and give this another three out of 10. Yeah, I'm gonna be real with you guys. I think I hate the X-Men now. Overall, I think the movies have not been that great, but the comics are pretty good. This one's supposed to be like crazy. I'm excited to read that. And we still have like a half a dozen movies to watch, so I'm gonna need a break real quick. Uh, I gotta finish some of these. I mean, you guys don't have to go anywhere, but just like, don't bother me. I'll see you next year. Hey, it's Stan Lee.